Well, someone asked me that, why have we written about buscocks and not swallowing the dogs? Which was a bizarre question. Uh, but, well, buscocks are... Yeah, saw the dogs had a couple of great singles. They did have a couple of great singles, but buscocks are pivotal to Manchester music, I think, in a way that very few artists are. So, if I was going to... I'd say the people who are in 10cc and the people who are in buscocks, in terms of bands, are the two most important bands that ever came from Manchester. There's a lot to deconstruct and unpack here, so yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the music in a minute. But the cultural thing is really important. I too. think that's I yeah. think that's really important, and it's common to both of them. That so obviously Howard and Pete and Richard Boone were into the Stooges, and then one day they get the enemy, and there's a review of this band that happens to mention that they play a Stooges song. So then they, they go off on this mad weekend to see them in like the, High Wycombe and Welling Garden City. And the next thought isn't, well, next time we get a few more, we'll come down to London and see them again. The next thought is we need to get these people back in Manchester. Which is, a, again, you know, let's do it in Manchester. It's an amazing thing as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of which is anything to do with why I love the band. I knew nothing of this. Mm -hmm. I just knew that they were one of the greatest pop bands who ever, that ever was. With brilliant lyrics, brilliant songwriter, great image and the best drummer in the world as well, which was really important to me. And they had great badges, which is massive. Yeah, yeah, it's the whole package, yeah, yeah. the whole 360. Yeah. I mean, it's, and the fact they actually was here, yeah. I think it's really important as well. I think, to me, Buzzcox took punk out of London and gave it to the rest of the world. I way. think so. I, yeah. I think, you know, I mean, the, the, well, Pistols played a few places, but I don't think, I think it came a bit later in a lot of other places. And once you were getting the Sex Pistols as a result of them being on the front of the Daily Mirror, that's a very different thing to getting them playing at the Lesser Free Trade Hall and seeing the band when they were amazing, you know. Because, they, right, you know, through no fault of their own in a lot of ways, they became a kind of cartoon after Bill Brunby and when they got Sid Vicious and, you know. They weren't, they weren't, they were great and then, and never mind the box, is an amazing, fantastic LP, but there was something slightly less shock of the new about them once they became this notorious kind of joke in a way. So what was your first experience with those cops? First time I saw them, which was a pivotal moment, was they played in Alexandra Park. There was a Rocket Against Racism gig in Alexandra Park in 1978. Now Alexandra Park had a particular point in my heart because I went to a school called St. Bede's, which was just the other side of So I used to get the bus from within shore to one side of Olive Park and I used to have to walk across it to get to St. Bede's and it was treachery. <laughs> there was another school called St. George's which my wife happened to attend uh, where their main role in life was to be the shit out of it. Is that how you uh, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before Buscox played there, my overriding memory of Olive Park was this guy jumped out, leapt up in the air, kicked me in the face, knocked me to the ground and stole my watch. That was one day. The next day I was in the back of a police car with these two policemen saying, if you see this guy, point him out. And then by the, that was the Tuesday, Wednesday, I was back walking across the park again on my own. <laughs> so, <laughs> tough love. But uh, yeah, so Alexander Park wasn't a favourite place of mine. It was, I was terrified every time I stepped foot in it. But the day of the Rock Against Racism gig in 1978, it was a glorious sunny day. I mean, obviously I've built this up in my mind. <laughs> glorious sunny day. It was a march from Strange Ways to Alexander uh, Park by the Rock Against Racism. We turned up, most were on stage. They'd already be, I'd already got another music music. We're all my favourite band by then. I had my accent. Pete Shelley comes on. I hope you all enjoyed your walk. And they did the gig, and it was just, and it was just one of them days, you know, where it was just this is this is exactly where I want to be. And it was, Alexandra Park was a friendly place. Most were the best band in the world. They had the coolest drummer who also went to our school. So he, he, so John Marr left school at left St Beans at 16 to join Buzz Cox. I left. St. Bean's of 16 to in the fall. So he was obviously a hero of mine. And it didn't help, it didn't hurt that he was the best drummer in the world either. Well, it wasn't the first time you played drums, you played the Buzzcock song, but yeah. your brother was kind of singing the drum part. Yeah, it? so um, I got. A, I used to play obviously along, I'd say obviously, I used to bang the arm of the chair onto the top of the pops as we all did. And I got a drum kit for my 14th birthday. But I, so I'd never used my feet and I'd never have my hands anywhere. So he said, well, band I've been seeing have got this song and it's all on the snare. You can play the whole song on the snare. Which isn't strictly true if you mm. go back. So that was the first song. Anyway, <laughs> 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 So the first song I ever learned 
was 16 Bible stocks. I hadn't heard it at that point. I'd only heard Steve going, he's done a little, a little, a little. <laughs> so until I got the album, then he played it, and ah, so it's like And then so that's how I learned to play the drums because I didn't have any lessons. But well, what I like about the book is kind of a personal account, it's yeah. like a fan's eye view of an, of an iconic band. Isn't yeah. it? Was that important to do the book like that? Say again. Was that important for you? It was. Well, I started like writing the, the original idea was to just write a straight biography. So you start writing a straight biography, and then I kept thinking, well, that's an opinion. You know? So you write. I can't. I, I got to the point where I can't write about another music in a different kitchen so, and step back and not say, well, this song's amazing because of this. This is fantastic. Listen to these words. So then I just give up trying and just thought, well, I'll just tell the story. It's, I mean, it's a, it is a biography of Buscock. It tells the whole story all the way through, but it's my relationship with them at the same time. Which I think is key. Yeah. It's the whole, it's, yeah. It's, I think it's the same trip that most people talk as well. Yeah. Well, I think that's a massive thing, that, that kind of, I, I don't know if it's, it's not strictly male, but that sign that of 14, well, you get you get your favourite band, you buy you know you, the posters are all over your wall. I mean, you know, people do it to take that. People do it with lots of bands, but it they've just become the most important thing in the world, you know. And was, was it, I mean, obviously, musically, yes, it's great. Lyrically, it's great. But was it because they were local as well? You yeah, the, I, affinity. To, something the, amazing was actually on your doorstep. The way I explain it is, it was just far enough away, so I couldn't do it with the fall because one of my oldest friends in the world was in the fall, and eventually my brother was in the fall. So you can't be a fanboy about someone that close, but Buzzcocks were one bus stop further away than that. So they rehearsed in the same place. So I could, you could see them in the cafe down the road from TJ Davidson's. We knew, went around to John Miles' house and knocked on his door, we went to Pete Shelley's house in Gordon and knocked on his door. So they were just far enough away, but just near enough away for me to have that complete fanboy experience, if you like. It's more than just the band as well, yeah. you know, the, the, as I said before, the artwork and the badges, etc. Yeah. It's almost like this kind of this little, <coughs> almost scruffy DIY art movement in Manchester, sort of circulate, circulating around Buzzcocks yeah. and their friends, isn't it? If you look at that circle, so you've got, obviously you've got <coughs> Pete Shelley, Howard Devolto, Linda, then you've got Malcolm Garrett, mm. who's made, you know, Pete Savile, Keith Breeden, and then out there, uh, Malcolm shared a flat with John McGott, who was uh, which is how we ended up in magazine, and Judy Blaine was in there, who's a you know fantastic designer. Yeah. Just all these sort of people. I mean, the way Malcolm describes it is, yeah, you know, but um, the stars were in alignment, but you've got to be looking at the stars to see it, you know. So there was a lot of talented people. Nobody got there because just because there was somebody's made, but there was no nepotism. It was all. It just seems to be that there was something happened. I mean, it happened all over the country, but. With punk in Manchester, it just so happened that it, it sparked a complete, you know, event, didn't it? And it kind of revitalised the city, didn't it? When you wrote the book, did it feel like there was something in that group of people? Something was going to happen at some point. Something was going to get sparked into action. I don't know. I don't know because it's one of those sliding doors things, isn't it? Like I say, if Steve Diggle had met the guy he was supposed to meet hmm. and not been Malcolm McLaren hadn't thrown him in and said he's in it. You talk about the uh, pistol, pistol kick. So, yeah, if, yeah. if you don't know, you're probably in the wrong room if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Diggle arranged to meet somebody outside the free trade hall to go for a pint in Cox's bar and discuss being in a band. So he comes outside, Malcolm McLaren says, what are you? He, there's a great band on in here. And he says, well, no, I'm, I'm meeting this guitarist. He says, well, he's in here. He's in here, come in here. And he's behind, you know, he's selling the ticket. Yeah. So he could have said, well, no, I'm not going in here, I'm not paying 50, 50p to take yeah. a way out, I signed for this other guy. But, so there's, that was like, how many times did that happen? Uh, obviously, there's a bit of uh, controversy about who was at the first, who was at the second. Marky e. Smith was at the second one, although he always said he was at the first, I think. But he was in, he tells the story, he's in Cox's bar, and Mark McLaren comes in and says, you know, so that could have been, he could have said, no, I'm, I'm the last buses in half an hour, I'm going back to the Foresters or whatever. But it, there was enough of those sliding doors moments at that time for it all to work. And like you say, there was 100 people there, maybe 40 of them, 30 of them formed a band or did something really culturally significant. Some of the 60 people who didn't. Mm -hmm. But still, it's enough, isn't it? As a percentage, it's pretty amazing. I, think. I mean, a lot of this, the early period, this really does sense around uh, Howard's Boats, yeah. um, Pete Shelley and Richard Boone. Yeah. They're, they're kind of the core three. Yeah. And one of my favourite set piece stories in punk is that we talked about before so briefly that trip to London. Yeah. You know, they read they read that review. Stooges mentioned the review. Pop said the review. Let's go and find this band. Yeah. No idea how to find it. They get the college car, borrow the college tape recorder, yeah, yeah. 
Because they want to make a punk band. They don't know what a punk band yeah, sounds like. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, I mean, you, I mean, how far do you go into that story? Do you go into it quite Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I tried to say, uh, the world doesn't need a retelling of this story, but this book does, so let's yeah. try and make it. Oh, it's, it's such a great story. Yeah, it is. It's it just, needs to be it's and, retold every day. And the, the, yeah, that, yeah. There's just so much sort of serendipity about it. So, <laughs> the enemy was selling like 300,000 copies. It's so ridiculous. So, he gets in a phone box and rings the enemy and says, uh, can I speak to the guy who wrote this review? And they go, yeah, yeah, oh, he's here, yeah, all right, okay. Uh, we we're looking about the set business. Oh, I know, that. I don't know where they're playing, but I know that the manager owns a shop. Well, he, he could have said, I'm, I went to see him, I know now about him, you know. But, uh, but just for all that to happen. And then they go to the, the shop, sex. Oh, they're playing tonight. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> all of that. Because they, they could have gone, you know, if they didn't play again for a month, the Sex Pistols, after that weekend. So they could have, if they've got the car the, the next weekend, they, none of that could have happened. Well, I mean, it's a fairy tale, isn't it? But that's how these things happen. That's why they're important. So you're going back and looking at the coincidence, but it's the other way around, isn't it? It all comes together and then it becomes the story. I mean, well, when you, I mean they're trying to get back together before that. Yeah, they had, a, they had a, especially. Yeah. And it's, it was kind of very ad hoc. I mean, what, what, I mean, there's no template, was it? It's no. Like trying to fumble around. Well, Pete, Pete was kind of, he done gigs. He had a band called Cog, who did, did covers and what have you. But he was quite ahead of the curve, I think. Pete. But so he knew what to do. He knew to ha how to hire a venue, which was another bit of serendipity that he, you know, he could have said, "I've no idea how to get a venue." He tried to get Bolton College, and Bolton College says, "They did this. They did oh, this." Thing. I always thought it's how Devoto, because he did the listings. The yeah. listings, didn't it? The, the uh, gig listings, so he knew... He might have got the freaks, well one of them got the free trade all, it? but that, that's quite a leap, isn't it? Let's put a gig on. It's quite ambitious. Let's, let's hire the less of free trade all. Yeah. How do you do that? I wouldn't know how to do that now, now we've got the internet. But um, I'll, I'll hire this venue in the right in the centre of Manchester. But the, the DIY of it all, like you say, the site in the uh, canteen at the college, they're reading the enemy, as people did, and there's, you know, the enemy was like that, it was, it was thick, there was a lot of stuff in it. So you read the other oh, review of Carly Simon here, oh there's this little review of this band at the Marquee, blah 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 blah, Iggy Pop number. Right, let's go to London and see these. I mean that's quite a big leap isn't it? Mm, I think it's a, it's a massive thing to go yeah. to. It's, it, without even knowing where the band was, who they were and where they are going to play, yeah. it's also intrigued me that. You know, it's incredible. You couldn't Google it. No. You just have, somehow you're going to bump well, it. I'll tell you what we'll do is, we'll get to London, we'll ring the NMA. And they'll be there. And they'll be there. <laughs> And I always liked the idea of the tape recorder, which for years I thought was about that big, but it was pretty big. And they, were a big tape on it, and they went to get to the recorder, which I've always thought, they took it home and analysed it, and somehow made their version of it. Yeah. Then. But I mean, Pete was a songwriter by then already. I mean, they didn't, well, they didn't start off playing. I mean, they, they could write, obviously he's a great songwriter, but they, they were trying to be a punk rock band, even though they didn't know what one was. Yeah. And that's always fascinating me. Yeah, well, because well, I asked Howard about that, because Pete had already made Sky Yen by then, so he, Pete knew his way around. Would you, would you ever would you ever be interested in doing electronics? No, that was against the rules. There was no way that you could do that. The punk was one guitar, one bass singer. There was no way they would have ever done that. But Pete was clearly a massively talented musician, and you can tell. I think. I think there's a lot of well, we can anybody can do this. You know, you, you just need these three chords. Here's, here's a chord. Here's another one. Now go and form a band. There's a, now there's an element of truth to that, but the. Sex Pistols, the, the, it's, the Sex Pistols were a great band musically. They were amazing band musically. Buscots were an amazing band. Musically. So, you know, the, you can say all you like about it, but the, for every Buscots, there's a worst. Mm. And they were right leading right uh, away. Well, well, deliberately, which is... Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah because when you listen to Spire Scratch or you listen to the Times you know, album, there is a degree of sophistication that's on right to me. Well, I, I'm not sure sophistication is the right word. No, it's, it's, the sound is raw. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the actual songs are unusually yeah, put they together. Yeah, but very, But not, not unusually put together because they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. Because they kind of knew what That's they were doing. That's a great thing, that, I think. Yeah. And it, it's impossible to fake, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That where you play this music because it's the only kind of music you can play, you know. Because, you know, you get to the musicians. Every riff they play has got a name, as Steve always says, you know, proper musicians, you know, you play this, oh, that's a blue, that's a Mixolodeon or whatever the bloody hell it is, but <laughs> yeah. there's a certain amount of people who can just say, well, I'll, I'll put my hand here and I'll move it up here, because the, the, that's what Tony also think about the bar chord is, you get a bar chord, you can play, you just go up and down the fretboard and write songs, and Pete could do that, and he did that, but Boredom is clearly someone going up and down, but then he could also write Love You More, he could write, he could write proper songs, and he had the ability to mix those two together. 
which is that's where the magic happens, I think. And that's kind of like Buscox part two, isn't it? Because the, yeah. the only thing with how to vote those, even though it's sort of the same people, it's almost a completely different project. Yeah, it? well, Buscox Mark II, or the classic Buscox, if you're more, <laughs> you gonna, they, they were my band. I started off with another music in a different kitchen and then worked forward with the band and then worked backwards to what do I get. And so as, as a fan, what was it like listening to the early records? It was, it was inter- I thought it was yeah. really interesting and I really liked it, but they were, it wasn't, it, it's never been the same band for me in a lot of ways, on, on some level. Buscox is, for me, Pete Shelley, Steve Diggle, Steve Garvey, John Marr, that's Buscox as far as I'm concerned. Not even Garth, you know. I mean, Garth was a great play, bass player. Oh. Did, you, did you find Garth? No, I did not. Yeah. I didn't speak to Garth. I'm too, I'd be too scared to keep speak to Garth. I spoke to a lot of people. Uh, I didn't speak to Garth. I deliberately didn't speak to Steve Diddle because I thought, I thought, I can't speak to Pete, obviously, God rest his soul. So I don't want to speak to Steve Diggle because it could be that I think he's, a, I get on really, really well with him and I don't want to write it. It's, you know, I had to be able to tell my own story. So I spoke to everybody around it. That was David Nolan. I, I talked to him about that because he's written loads of books about bands and he always said speak to everyone around but don't speak to the person in the middle because you get you, you think they're great you're never going to write the book you need to write you know, also they don't always know the story because the story yeah, is revolving that's right yeah, yeah 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 so i mean we'll just get on to buscocks classic buscocks in yeah. a sec but um sparrow scat gp was really important i think yeah. you know uh being probably the first independent record release of our generation yeah. very inspiration inspirational for a lot of people yeah. You, you would see that and you think, wow, you can actually make your own records. I mean, is that something you sort of embraced in the book? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, <coughs> again, it's, it's astounding because um, one of the things that I talk about in the book is when Pete did a talk with Dave Aslan at Gorilla and they did a Q&A at the end, and that was a quick question I asked him. What do you think was more culturally important, bringing the Sex Pistols to Manchester or releasing Spiral Scratch? Which is a trick question because it's impossible to answer <laughs> that question, isn't it? But imagine being in a set you did both, you know, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. So, um, Spiral Scratch was amazing because it was, again, it was, without, uh, without wishing to bang on about it, it didn't involve London. I mean, not all of it was pressed in London, probably, but um, it was, we can do this, you know. And you th- if you think about the time, you forget, don't you? Nobody did that. There was no Rough Trade. Rough Trade was a record shop. Mm. They didn't make records. Nobody made records. And for it to be, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a vanity project. It, it was sold, you know. It, it, they, they pressed up a thousand or whatever it was, and it sold, and then they pressed up some more. It wasn't give it away at gigs or any of that crap. It was this is a this is in record shops, this. and this is how you do it. And on the back it says first take, one over dub, you know. And the demystification. Yeah, the demystification, the demystification yeah. is the really key to it. I think. I've always been fascinated with Martin Hammett actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Recording it, that's kind of interesting. It, it is. Well, that was the first thing he did. That was the first production he ever did. Well, I'm, I'm not. I think productions. Productions of it. There's not a lot. There's not a lot of production on it's that. It's a little bit of reverb on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's the early days. Yeah, yeah. But Phil, Phil Hampson, who's, who ran the Indigo Studio, would say he might have said, "Oh, that's good." <laughs> All right, take that mine. Well, and then, then we'll do it. you know, he went back in and remixed it without telling anybody. But then you would say that, wouldn't you? If you're right, and then you're right. So, Yo, I went back in and remixed it. Nobody knew. <laughs> Nobody knew. <laughs> Then it comes out, and about a week later, Howard Devoto quits the band. Yes. With that amazing statement, which is so great. Which makes no sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's interesting that if you compare Howard to, say, John Lydon, by the time Howard left Muscox, John Lydon was pretty much in the same position in a way. He'd, he'd written, Techpers had written all but, say, three of the songs he were ever going to write. <laughs> and it took John Lydon 18 months to say, I've had enough of this time. Mm. And I want to do something a bit more without the same boundaries. Because whatever you say about Buscox Mark One, it was a, it was really sort of tightly controlled. There was a sound, there was and he, he was a lot of the time he was kind of doing an impression of Johnny Rotten. Mm-hmm. You can hear it in the voice. You can hear it in the voice, yeah. you can, yeah. For him to say, right, I'm, go- I'm not gonna do that. I mean he, he was tired of but he wanted to finish his degree, which is great. But then he didn't hang about what magazine, you know, magazine was out before the electric circus shut, if you were, if you were, if that's how we were, you know, we're judging time as be, be, before the electric circus shut and after. <laughs> so he got in right at the end. Uh, so yeah, he didn't, but he recognised that Buscox wasn't enough for him musically. And I don't, it would have been a travesty, I think, if Pete Shelley hadn't become a singer in his own right. No, it's almost like they knew. Yeah, as well. it is, yeah. I think a lot of the reason he felt comfortable in leaving Buscox is because he knew they'd be all right. right? 
Well, he carried on managing them. Yeah, yeah, he did. He's yeah. taking the demos to London yeah. and records. Yeah. Which is... yeah, in fact, I haven't got time to do this anymore. And they do the first gig they do in London, he went with them. So. <laughs> he reconvened very quickly, yeah. and it's all built around Pete, and then it kind of goes off in that direction. But even that orgasm addict is a left over from. Yeah, yeah, so there's orgasm addicts of song, it's on Time's Up. Time's Up is like the bootleg of everything that they've all landed in. And there's like three songs on another music that still that they played with Howard. And that's that's another key thing, and that how good the how do all songs are with Pete Singer and how well how you know how accepting everybody was of because it's always a massive thing when a singer leaves a band, isn't it? You know, and are they gonna carry on? And they just carried on and it was almost like a non event in some ways, you know, they, they didn't, it wasn't like, well, who the fuck's that singing now? You've got the rhythm guitarist singing it, but I think that's a mark of Pete's talent. He could sing other people's, other people's lyrics with as much passion as he sang his own, passion as he sang his own, you know. Because he sang <coughs> Richard Boone a couple, and he sang them. Mm. And then, then he also he stepped up as a songwriter, yeah. didn't he? And that glorious one of singles, I mean, we're not writing Deagle out of this, we're in a minute, but. So many great lyrics, so many great songs, I and mean, yeah. lyrically, it was, it was amazing. One of the what? So many great love songs ever written, aren't they? Kind of bittersweet. Yeah, they're not love, love songs, songs. That's the thing, they're not love songs. They're all, none of them, pretty much none of them, is about a healthy relationship. They're all about the space in Pete's head, and, you know, and how he struggles to articulate what he wants from a relationship. You know. So they're about, they're not just, you know, they're not. A groovy kind of love. They're, they're, uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 Which is a great song, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The yeah. first song at my wedding, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. but no, it's the, 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 the strange and the. Because um, Love You More, all the way through it, is this love song, I love you, and that. But then right at the end, of it, he slashes his wrists. So, mm -hmm. you know, and he, he was, that sort of lyrical rig, rug pull, he was a master of, you know. Mm -hmm. And you think it's about this, but it's not actually about this. And, most of them are about his sort of struggles with his, you know, because he, he did struggle with depression and it got kind of, you know, got quite unhealthy, I think, towards the end of the Scots, which was one of the reasons for the demise of the band, I think, the first time. But to be able to articulate that and to be able to go back and say, this is what I thought when I was 16, when you're a 20 whatever year old, or even when you're a 40 year old, he could, he could put himself in that space and say, this is what it feels like to be a 16 year old boy struggling with relationships and his ability to inhabit that space was amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and you as somebody at that time, 16, 17, yeah. did you relate to that? Did, did you yeah, I, I did, I mean I, I did relate to relationships because I didn't have any. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of half what it's about. Yeah but, no, but it, yeah. he articulated the, the confusion of a 15 year old very well <laughs> without, it's not puppy love, it's not condescending and it's not you know trite mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a really difficult thing to do that you know you can, you can talk about you know, it, it got dismissed a bit, even by members of the band at the time, who I was writing these love songs, but they're not really, they're not love songs in that, in what I would describe as a love song, uh, talking about why you love someone and why it's great. There's, non, there's very little of that. Mm. I mean, um, you say you don't love me, it's about the only of his songs that's got a happy ending, and the only reason that's got a happy ending is because he sacks it all off at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I let's just call it, yeah. I think you're very nice, but I don't love you, that kind of thing. And right from the start, how was that dynamic between him and Steve Dickel? Well, it, I, well, I struggle with this a bit, because for me, I got into Buscott's first album, so you've got every song sung by Pete, except Autonomy, and, which Pete sings out of, mm -hmm. and he plays this amazing guitar solo, and, you know, and then I was, you know, I like Steve Diggle's song, stuff, <coughs> they were picked, it's completely about me, Steve, they were, for me, Buscott were Pete Shelley's, Pete Shelley's vehicle, if you like. And uh, there was, a, there was an interesting dynamic. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think he's got some great songs in Dickel. Uh, but I think that was one of the key dynamics of the band is Pete, Steve struggled to find his place, you know. And then the thing with, with Pete is he, he do it, you know, he went with the path of leaf resistance a lot of the time, you know. So, yeah. and then, but I don't think once you get to the point where you get the, the three singles on the bounce, whether one side Pete, one side Steve, I think that bounce has gone slightly too far the other way. I think, I think you want you want Steve's songs to be like George's songs or Pete's songs. You know what I mean? A different kind of tension, if you will, <laughs> or, to call it a, a lyric. But um, yeah, so once it becomes parody, then it's not quite the same for me. But what do I know? But in a way, do you think the dynamic between the two of them? It's part of it's, the I think it's absolutely key to the yeah. band because, you know, 
I wasn't massively, in, I mean, part of that was I became of an age, but I wasn't massively interested in Peter's as a solo artist. I was into, and, and he kind of fundamentally, about Buscocks, it's, it's the two of them, isn't it? Well, clearly, evidentially, you can't have Buscocks without the two. Well, you can now, mm -hmm. Circumstances have dictated that you can't have Buscocks without the two of them. But um, that it is key. Buscocks isn't the same as Pete, it's not Pete Shelley and four people, it's Pete Shelley, Steve Diggle, and possibly two other people. But, I think even then, the other people who are in the band at the various stages were really, really important to the band. And I think one of the other things I wanted to address in the book is um, Phil Barker and Tony Barber, they kind of get written out of the story really, but that was the most stable line that Buscox ever had and they, you know, and they did for a long time and I think they were really key to Buscox going from that kind of fly by the city pants, we don't know what the hell we're doing, to being a, a, a career band or a heritage band. But they weren't, they, you know, they did new albums, but I think a lot of that was down with Tony. You know, and he does, he gets, he get kind of whitewashed out, don't they? He just becomes Steve, Pete and two others, which isn't right, I guess they wanted <laughs> it more, you know. Maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you think of that, you know, because initially Buzzcox, it's quite, it's a very arts, pop art band, really, of the moment, yeah. which is kind of totally genius, but in the end, they would be a band that could just play for decades, just playing the hits. But they were good at it. Yeah, yeah. And those gigs are great. It's almost like a completely different idea. It is, yeah. Which and is fair enough as well, isn't it? It is fair yeah. enough. I mean, I think Pete enjoyed being in Buscox, but I think to a later period, I don't think it was. I don't know. Pete, were, Buscox were great when Pete was struggling with his mental health. And I don't think it's a price worth paying, mm. quite frankly. And I really, I am really happy that he got to a place in his life, in the later life, when he lived in Italian. Estonia, where he could dip into Buscox and really enjoy it and, and have a nice time and meet people and then he could go back to his life. I wouldn't begrudge him that for anything in the world. I wouldn't begrudge any artist that. I, like I say, if, if my favourite band being great depends on the lead singer <laughs> contemplating suicide, I'd, you know, I'd rather they didn't do it. Thanks. And it was one of the greatest, greatest hit sets you could possibly have. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, that run, like you say, that run of singles from What Do I Get? I mean, all is slightly different, isn't it? Because that's kind of sort of, you know. But that run of that right up to when they split up is just faultless. I mean, the last three singles were produced pretty shockingly when they got Martin on it back in, I think. That just didn't work at all. No, not it? at all. No, no. no. I mean, they were all off the faces as well. That's the other thing. Steve and Pete and Martin on it were just Cause trashed. Do you deal with this in the book, though? Martin, yeah. Martin Russian is probably the great unspoken. He is, yeah. And I, book, I, I, I think. It? I think Pete's partnership with Martin Russian was at least as strong as his partner with Steve Dillon mm. in terms of songwriting. And <coughs> the stuff they did together was just incredible. I, I found out right in the book that the backing vocals of Martin Russian are mm. I always thought it was Steve Dillon. I always thought, because he did it live, obviously, but no, they fallen in love with Pete and yeah. Martin Russian, which is what? But that, that and I, he, he was such a good producer for them, better than he was with the Stranglers, I think. I think they got in, you know. The way they work together, I still say the sound of another music different kitchen is. I every time I've ever been in the studio, I thought, can you make me bass drum sound like the beginning of fiction romance? And the toms need to sound like moving away from the pulse pit. I can't get past it. It's just, I mean, it took me a long time to listen to the rest of the instrumentation on that album. I could just, I mean, I've said it in the book. There's Live at the Witch Trials and a different kind of tension. It took me months to listen to anything else except the drums. The drums are just perfect on both of those albums. And yeah, you have to make a conscious effort to think, oh, the guitar's quite good, and the bass is good. I find it very difficult to get past John Marby. And oh, he's an amazing drummer. You, I, I think, you know, on Spiral Scratch, I've been drumming for four weeks or something. I think it's like 12, I think. I think 12. 12. I mean, 12, that's, that's not exactly 12 is quite, quite something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he didn't have yeah. lessons either. Or anything. You know, he just had a drum kit in his front room. And, and a really original style, though. Yeah, well, that's one of the key things, is what Buscox needed was a brilliant drummer who was who hadn't been knocking around playing in pub bands for years? He wanted someone who wasn't going to be like you know, can play all right now or any of that shit. He, he had original thought, and they got exactly the right one. Mm. In fact, but the rhythm section I think is key as well. I think it's more than Shelley did. I think all four of them. Yeah, you know, the, Steve the, Garvey was just brilliant. The, the, really melodic bass. Yeah, and he just he does this thing where there's a guitar solo, and he plays like a different bass line under the guitar solo. It's like a, Bounces off the guitar song. Yeah. 
I mean, this is a bit newsy, but I'm news old. But well, I, I don't think he'd even be thinking what he was doing. He just sounded good. Yeah, he's he's a, but he was an amazing yeah. musician, Steve Gavin. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, absolutely. And that, like I say, the, once you got the four of them, that's, that was. And I, I, the four of them, and me being 14, 15, 16, there was just a marriage made in heaven as far as I'm concerned. I don't think you can get back to that. Why would you want to? I mean, of, of the three albums, do you write them in different ways? Yeah, so yeah. I, I always think. Um, Another Music in Different Kitchen is my favourite album ever. Love Bites was more important to me the day it was released than any album ever because I went down, we, we had to bunk off school. So that was, it came out on the 22nd of September. <laughs> um, so the thing about it was to get the badges. The badges were really important. So the shop's got a limited number of badges. So we can't leave it till half four here. If we can't go after school, we're going to have to go lunchtime here. There's no way. We get two and a half hours and no badges. <laughs> Might as well not buy the album if we haven't got the badges. So we booked off school at St Bede's, we got the 88 into Piccadilly and then we went to the underground market to buy the album, got back and we thought if we get, we would have got the strap if, we'd, if they'd have found out we'd have gone out of school, we'd have got the strap. So, so yeah, that was the, one of the more key moments of my life was getting that album the day it was released. Uh, I didn't get the strap as it turned out. One of my teachers came up to me late in the afternoon and said, oh, I saw a boat. I saw a lad, he looked just like you on the bus. <laughs> but it can't have been you, because you're not daft enough to leave school. Like I mean, what a game, well, you know, yeah. But and I think different kind of tension has got Pete's best songs in it. So you've got my favourite album, the most important album, and the one with the best songs. So I can't pick, I can't pick which one of them to go with. For me, different kind of tension edges it, because it's what they do amazingly there is they deconstruct their sound. Yes. Yeah. And it's quite experimental, but it's still an amazing pop record, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the thing about it is, and I think it became a bit of a straight jacket, the, the, the limits of the Buscock sound is a beautiful thing, and you can go from, you know, Love You More to um, I Believe, and the, the sim yeah. Sonic Pan is pretty similar, but and, but the stuff they do within that is just incredible, I think. And it, yeah, I think singly, that is their greatest yeah. talent, you know, how many different ways can you play a buzz song? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah. And it is really, really different. Yeah. And again, also the interplay between the two tasks. Yeah, I think that's, that's, really, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the other things when Howard left is that Steve moved over to guitar, so they had two guitars. So a lot of the time they play the same thing, but, but then what's great about that is when they don't, it just, it just leaps into the air. Yeah. Amazing. I, don't, I, I, have no, I have no way of being dispassionate about it. Uh, why would I want to be? And then also Markham's great artwork as well, which you think really matches the music. I think it, yeah, I think it, uh, one of the things I, is, I think it, it's like the fifth member of the band, that artwork for me. It's almost as important as the music. I mean, if you'd got the album and the badge and got home and the album was a pile of shite, it would have been <laughs> But it didn't, I think, and just to, you know, it's a cliche, you know, to hold that in your hand when you've got a 12 inch and you pull it out, because you get any, a lot of the albums then, you get the cardboard sleeve, you get a paper, the label is either the Virgin label or AMI or whatever, but everything about Buscock, so you've got another, diff, uh, another different kind of tension or you've got uh, another music, you know, like a black sleeve in the middle, the sleeve, the paper in the middle was a Buscock's logo, and um, it came in a carrier bag with product written on it, you know, it's like really self-aware and then again the badges. Attention to detail. Yeah, the attention to detail yeah. was just incredible, yeah. You, you didn't get it, you know. If you look, the Clash didn't have a logo even, never mind, you know. And then mm -hmm. kind of throw, and I, I never, I was never massively keen. I mean, Jamie Reed stuff's great, but it dates very quickly, that ripped newspaper stuff, doesn't it? Whereas I think Buscock's design is timeless. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Ma Malcolm Garrett, I don't need to sell Malcolm Garrett, he did real for crying out, you know. He, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, I think his work's amazing. And he designed the cover of my book, by the way, if in case you <laughs> And again, it was, um, you know, it's a, it a different way of looking at Manchester, I think. You know? yeah. It was uh, at that time a city that was probably in decay, you know, size. Yeah. And it's something really modern and angular and clean with perfect lines. Yes. It's I think that's really key, yeah. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't trash or, like I say, ripped up newspapers. Or it was, look at this, look at this design and this lines. And it. This is important. How things look is important, you know. It, you, you know, you're not selling, you're selling the whole thing in a way and it's how it looks is important and uh, uh, the whole aesthetic of that, it definitely bled into factory. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it was the example of Malcolm working Bulls Cox that got Pete Sandler to approach Sonny Wilson, you know, and then you look at the, the marriage of aesthetic and music in factory and then it ended up transforming the whole city. I think so, I would, I would definitely argue that yeah. as well. I think um, the base, everything that goes on in Manchester now, from the music to where we are now, yeah. it starts with Bulls Cox, yeah. but somehow, it, 
That doesn't get said enough, does no, it? No, no, well, I, I think, there. I think yeah. the other thing that gets missed is Pete's attitude to his sexuality massively was a massive influence. It, it wasn't because to be gay or bisexual or whatever, before then it was either a selling point, so you made a big thing with your Elton John or whatever, or it was to be swept under the carpet. With Pete Shelley, it was just, this is who I am, if you don't like it, you can fuck off, you know. He went to the ranch. And I think that was, you know, the fact that Manchester got the you know, biggest gay village in the world was, I think part, I, you know, I think part of that was the attitude to be, to be you just be what you want to be, you know. And his, his attitude to sexuality, his lyrics were never he or she. It was just, you know, gender's a fluid thing. And it was years ahead of his time. You know, you yeah, know. That, I think that's another really key. Part yeah, yeah. Of I mean, really. when he was doing that and he was saying that, you know, you still had Paul Weller saying he was all right to be kind to queers, in, you know, and yeah. Johnny Rotten saying faggot, and you know, mm. he was. Which I didn't have a problem with at the time. You know, well, I, I should have done, but I didn't. Mm. I'm not yeah. saying that, but he was just so far ahead of that curve in terms of his sexuality is whatever the you know you want it to be, and it's nobody's business but yours. You know. Yeah, I mean, I mean now that's an easy, thing, easier thing. It to is do an easier it. thing. Yeah. But then. Place I mean, you know, <laughs> it's all very well saying that, but you've still got to leave the ranch and get on the bus to go back to Gold, you know. Or, or go and play gigs on the circuit. Or go play, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. 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 And it, it, it just, it was just who he was, Pete. He was, you know, there's, you, you never get, you know, when he had his, when he died and there was obituaries, there were none of them saying, blah, 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 but it was always nice to me, you know, that <laughs> thing you get, or, you know, like, he said this, but at different times. He, there's no, there's no, no need to go back and correct what he did, because he was, he was just, Great then, you know. Isn't that the kernel of what the people talk about punk and politics? Isn't that the most critical thing? It is, yeah. You, you just are, and that's it. There's no manifesto. That's right, yeah. Yeah. That was. I think that was. Uh, that, I think that was. People, you know, that's the thing about he just writes love songs, and, and I want to write something political, which is bollocks. If if you're part of the expert. that that thing that you know, if you're talking about you know, Gary's life, not Gary's life, but you know, talking about hate and war and all that. That's all very well, but. Well, talking about your the human condition is is political. It might be a small p, but it's it, and you know it's no coincidence that the, the, one of the classic songs that lasts is "Should Have Stayed, Should Have Go." It, I think Mick Jones got the freedom to go back to writing songs like that by looking at buscombs. I think so. I'm training vain because the, you know people were embarrassed about that, that can't write love songs. I think he, I'm so bored with you because I'm so bored with the USA because he couldn't write love songs anymore. But Pete Shelley said, well, yes, you can. You can write about relationships. You can write about the human condition. You don't have to write about storm in the barricades. It's all political, when it's all real, when it's all important. They're all their kind of cool, sort of clothes on. And this band turned very homemade looking. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, Steve Diggle says that. He said, you put a pair of straight legs on in Manchester. It was like, oh, my God. And then <laughs> they got that on the screen on the green. And Susie's there, half undressed. It, it must have been like, what a culture. What, what John Marr must have thought. Because he was like 16, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he says in the book, like, um, when the Sex Pistols turned at the Feast for the thought, what the fuck have I got myself into? Because <laughs> <laughs> they look like they'd be chin you as soon as look at themselves, didn't they? Mm. Yeah, there was, there was a homespun innocence to it. There was, yeah. yeah. I think so. I think they were quite familial in a way. You know, they, they were, they were uh, nurturing. It, it, it sounds ridiculous. I felt they were a safe space, which is ridiculous, isn't it? But, yeah. In a band. Because, uh, you know, but, they weren't. They didn't look like they were going to kick me head in. They looked like maybe a brew, you know. Which is good. <laughs> yeah. I had enough people who were going to kick me head in. Go, let's go. So I didn't need it from my favourite. I, I know you did actually because I remember at Sea Buzz Cops when they played Blackpool. There was a massive fight between skinheads beating all the punks up. Pete Shelley goes up to Mike goes, stop fighting for your uncle Peter. That was that That was the thing. Wasn't it? it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there the, were. The, some of them gigs then were pretty horrible. Mm. Jesus. People now go to gigs to have a good time, I just don't get it. Yeah, what's that about? <laughs> what's that about? I love this band, I'm going to spit all over them. <laughs> <laughs> so, where did Buzz Cox sit in the Manchester band scene? Obviously, you were, you were in another band. Yeah. What, what was Buzz Cox kind of. Buzz Cox were really, really supportive of the other bands. They paid for the Falls first record, the whole Single Master's Breakout. Mm. Buzz Cox and Richard Boone paid for that. They couldn't be moved. They thought about putting it out, they couldn't afford to put it out. And the first thing Pete Hook and Barney did when they decided to form a band was ask Pete Shelley, how do you form a band? You know? And Buzzcocks took the fall to London, they joined him and supported them on the tour. 
sort of the worst on them, which they might have regretted, I don't know. <laughs> John Cooper Clark, he, he got into, you know, it was Howard DeVos said to John Cooper Clark, you shouldn't be playing these places, you shouldn't be playing pub gigs, you'd go down a storm. Because John Cooper Clark was like, well, I, I addressed the part already. <laughs> But it was, it was how they also said you should be playing punk gigs, and they put John Cooper Clark on it. Yeah. So I mean, obviously a big cultural massive, driver in massive. Manchester. I think so. I think I don't think you can overestimate how important they were. I think they changed Manchester. Just got one way or other, directly or indirectly. Do you, you think? Know, you know, somebody's lived here all your life, and things. Was there a slight disappointment when they went to London? Well, they moved. All bands went to London. All bands. Those days, I, 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 it took them longer than most. I think. But you know, with the way they're, they're a cultural driver in Manchester. Yeah. Eventually, that's what Tony and Patrick did, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. They stayed here and they've tried to force everyone to stay here. Did they go to London? Did they? Well, they did, didn't they? Well, they went to London. I mean, you have to go to London. They've gone back. <laughs> Eventually. But only it's not. not like they had to stay here. When they were, when, they were still living in Gorton when they were full of them. A few years, wasn't it? But they went down there. Yeah. And you know, and like we talk about there, they, they've been the key driver in getting yeah. all this cultural creativity going here. Yeah. Then it seemed to be gone. And the it whole did. thing happened without them, didn't it? Maybe. The, the, yeah. There was that, that gig, that Stuff the Superstars gig, which was uh, all the bands in Manchester played. And I think the Stuff the Superstars were Buscocks. I think that was who they meant. <laughs> but bloody hell, there were different times, weren't they? What did they do, Buscocks? They, so they started, they got the Sex Pistols up here, they started every bloody band in Manchester, they started independent music. <laughs> Who do they think they yeah, are? Yeah, because yeah. Steve Diggle got a flat in London, it's like, these sell out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was kind of thinking more. You know, there's more work to be done, but they, you know, would they not, um, and they not follow it through? Have they not done it off, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's kind of good what they did, you know, I like them, what they were doing there. Well, well yeah. they did more than anybody else, so mm. if they didn't do enough, then okay, but, you know, nobody else did what they did. What? <laughs> Who's who that? <laughs> so, so, so did, this is the love of Buzzcocks that sustained through their whole career as well. No, about I wouldn't, well, I would think... You, would you still go and watch them? I still used to go and see them, yeah, but on, yeah. The, I think, I said, I think when I got, when I joined the four, it wasn't really done then to be, I'd be a fanboy of anything, you know, you could... It's, it's you'd be like this. the other yeah. way around. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. certain ways you're over there, oh, I'm not looking at them, they might think we like them, that kind of thing. It was, you're 16 now, lad, you can't be seen as being a fan of anything. So I kind of cut off, like, it was like, when I joined the fall, it wasn't really the dumb thing to be a massive fanboy of anything. I mean. But you go and watch them later. I always went to see him, yeah, yeah. I went to see him, I think the last time I saw him was when they did that 40th tour. So yeah, they went, went, went quite, quite a number of times. But it, was, it wasn't the same. <laughs> and well, you wouldn't want it to be the same, would you? I mean, you'd be a bit the weird. Comedies. No, yeah. you'd be a bit weird if you're 40 years old. This would be favourite band. You know? That dynamic between Pete and Steve yeah. was, was, was playing out on the stage all the time. It was, yeah, yeah. In a way that was quite funny, wasn't it? It was hilarious, yeah, because <laughs> Pete obviously stands there like, you know, like, like, you, like your auntie at a party. You know? Yeah, it's like Steve sideways. Steve Diggle's <laughs> giving it all this thing. Rock and roll, come on, you know, and Pete shows Pete's rocking out. his eyes, and he will see him. But it kind of worked, though, didn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think it worked because... Pete didn't lean into it. I think that was great. I think that was so he's giving it loads on the side and rock and roll and putting his mic out and all that crap. And then Pete till he's going, oh, okay, he's off again. And then, you know, it was like a it was like a manager, you know, the way they bounced off each other. It was great. I mean, I'm not sure once you get on that circuit of festivals and all that, I'm not sure whether Pete's persona was big enough to kind of carry that off. And, you know, when you're at some bloody festival in America sponsored by a train ship or whatever. You know, you, need, you needed a bit of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Right or wrongly, probably wrongly in my experience. Because, but, and I think anybody who came along later and saw that that's how they are, it's like, okay, fair enough. But when you were used to them being understated, I think it took a bit of, what, what's this, you know, this rock and roll thing. And that. It never, it was, it was more about me than it. It, it was, you know, but I was used to them being shuffling on and him saying, all right, have you had your tea? Right. <laughs> so when he's giving it, oh, you know, oh, you know, Mexico, come on, you know. <laughs> What's this? It's not, it? Well, it wasn't the end of me, was it? So. Was the unstated thing key part of them as well, you know, initially? I think so. I think that they were cool, you know, and not in a, it, they were cool in the real sense of being cool, in that they didn't care about being cool. Which you is didn't cool. have to ask anybody to like it. Yeah, they exactly so right. Good. I mean, because the, the uncoolest thing in the world is to try and be cool, isn't it? Mm. Mm. And they, I don't think they ever did. Well, they might have done it a bit, but... Mm. No, they, they, were, they were just, in my head, 
they didn't care. They were, this was PC I got on and said, this is me, and if you don't like it, well, it's all right. I'm, I'm not going to win you over. I mean, he always said that he tried to make music that nobody would like, you know, that was his main... Because I don't know if you've heard Sky yet. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard... No, no, he couldn't do it. He was fundamentally incapable of doing it. Well, he tried... I don't know if you've heard Sky yet. I mean, you know, you're not, you know, you're not listening to that every night, are you? <laughs> Stick Sky yet on while we're having our tea. He got it out of the system. Yeah, he did. Enough, did he? But yeah, yeah, but... I mean, what a talented guy, you know, he had that... He had that whole side of, like, of electronic... I and mean, he wasn't like... He was a proper boffin. I, I, I think he had both, so... He wasn't, they were both, both straight jackets. The guitar hero was a straight jacket and the techie boffins a bit of a straight jacket. And he had both, so it was, he wasn't tied to either. He didn't have to try and be, you know, dead cool on stage and he didn't, he was, he was just who he was, you know. This is what's well, interesting about it, isn't it? Because he, he is coming from a, a left field pop, yeah. pop culture yeah. and somehow worked out how to make pop music. Yeah. But still through a, a sort of an avant garde lens, isn't it? Hmm. I mean, in a way, it's, it's kind of like, Paul McCartney, in a way, you know, he uh, he could, you know, he uh, was every bit as high as John Lennon was, but he could do anything, couldn't he, mm. John McCartney? So he kind of gets, he kind of gets all the look that he was the first one making tape loops and all that, you know, because he was such a consummate pop pop artist as well. So he, he had everything, and I think and to a degree Pink did as well, you know. But I think the. The strictures of Buscocks quite they were quite well dominated, weren't they, Buscocks? You know, the, the, they had a sound that they couldn't really break out of, and I think that was why they had a perfect career in a lot of ways. That was that finishing in '81, because some, they had to do something different at that point, and it would have been very difficult because they were so good. I mean, the Classy's first album sounds like it's recorded on a transistor radio, so they had somewhere to go. Whereas Buscocks first album they progressed significantly from the live sound by the time they made the first album. <coughs> So then that was set then, why would you mess with that? You know, this is perfect. And I think that became, when, the, when you got to the fourth album that we were trying to record, I think Pete couldn't do it anymore. So they went off to did, did Homo Sapien. Wasn't, wasn't that one of those demos? Yeah, they, they, it, was, it was his idea was mm. to present it as Buscock song. But uh, they, they sort of pissed about with it and then Martin Usher turned up and said, this isn't working at all, you've got nothing. Because Steve Diggle had 48 songs, as he always did, you know. And Pete, Pete Kelly had two riffs. Yeah. And Martin Rush said, well, you can't, you can't make a Buscox album until Pete is sufficiently motivated with it in his material to bring it forward. So we'll go off and do some demos. Now, whether he had it in his head that that was going to be a solo career, because I don't think Pete did. I don't think Pete planned anything, really. So they go off and do almost, uh, Homo Sapien, that album, in Martin Rush's back garden, he built the studio. And that, the sound of that was another massive leap forward, and it was really, really influential, certainly on the Human League, mm. to the point where they got Martin Rush to produce there, you know. So even that, at that point in time, head of the game. Yeah, yeah, the next definitely, yeah. This is a very early electronic It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's great. I love it, I think it's great. It's great, it's, it's yeah. great. But, but one of the things I talk about in the book is, weirdly, I was obsessed with Dare. I mean, I loved Dare as an album, never had. Pete Shelley. Pete Shelley would be favourite artist. Mm. Buscox split up. I don't know if I'd make Oh, you're so heartbroken. Maybe I was, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I've never listened to your stuff. It's, it's, it's borderline perverse. I didn't get it. <laughs> so have you gone back to it? Yeah, yeah, I have now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and I, I don't, I, I think he's a brilliant songwriter all the way through, but it doesn't mean the same to me. And I can't pretend that it does. I don't want to pretend that it does, you know. But the big thing is that relationship when you're that age and you get that bad. Who are there, you know, they're not in LA, they're not in New York, no, they're, they're in Gold, you know, they're, they're across the road. And it, it was, I think it says much about me as it is about the band in the way. The story. Which is like a book. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which makes it a really good book, I think. They did this, then they did this, then they did this, then they did this. You can look that up, you know. Mm. So, on this day, I went to see them, and uh, Steve Garvey gave me a badge, and that's more worth writing about than. He did this song and he looked so, you know, I think so. I, I, I think it's kind of post information now. We've got all the information. You've got to write about how you feel, right? Mm, yeah, because people relate to that. That's yeah, yeah. important to keep yeah. art on the book. So, is there any questions for the floor? Absolutely made up for you. This is a chocolate blocker room, the standing room at the moment. Absolutely fantastic. I'm really, really pleased. The weird thing about buscocks and books, because that's what this. Uh, Weekend's all about is how few there are. It's mad, isn't it? It's crazy because Tony McGarton's book, which is that kind of like 
Yeah. We had our tea, we had egg and chips at the service yeah. station and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You've got Steve Diggle's book, which is hard and heavy lifting. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not it's, it, that, I, I, I said that, I think that's one of the least curated books. It's like someone set a tape recorder off in the pub next to him and just transcribed everything he said and not done anything else. Yeah, so you, which is weird given all the influence. People yeah. must talk to no emo, no punk pop, no green day, no all of this. Yeah, yeah. Why has there been so few books about buzzcocks? I think one of the reasons is that everything gets, it manages to get overshadowed by factory. People get obsessed with factory and think it's all factory, but it, it clearly isn't all factory. And like we said, a lot of the idea that Patrick came from Buzzcocks anyway. And New Hormones. Yeah, and and yeah, the template's there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think that, I, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you why that is, because I think it's mad that there's, how many books are there about the Clash? How many books are there about the Sex Pistols? And how many books are the Buzzcocks? Two and a half. You know, it's mad. I think because they were actually self, quite self-deprecating, and they weren't aware of creating the myth as they were going along, were Yeah, but that, is that enough of a reason for them not to write? It's a big reason, is it? Yeah, maybe. Well, you tell, you tell enough people you're important, then people will think you're important. It, it does seem to work, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You've made a career out of it. <laughs> you fucked it up, though. <laughs> <laughs> Question, no question, no, they're, they're just into the slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, where did they get the name from? <laughs> kill, kill it, the mystery there. Right, so. Were they sitting on top of a bus one day? The name, no, the name. Looking out of a window. Bus cops. I can tell you where. That's the only thing I've ever heard. I can tell you where they got the name. So, the weekend they went down to see uh, Sex Pistols. They were looking to find, as we said, they were trying to find out where they were. They bought a copy of Time Out. And Time Out, the listings magazine, had a TV section. And one of the articles was about Rock Follies. I don't know if anybody remembers Rock yeah. Follies. Yeah. So it was starting on the Tuesday after, I think, or Wednesday or whatever. And the article was about, and it had a quote from Julie Covington's character, Dee, about what it's like to be in a band. And she was explaining what it is when you're on stage, and she said, the big thing is it's the buzzcock, and cock is, you know, like the northern kind of expression of yeah. familiarity. So it's the buzzcock. And I think it, the reason it spoke to Howard and Pete is when they spoke to the guy at the NMA, he said, Malcolm McLaren always got a shop on the King's Road called Sex, and they thought it was a sex shop, they thought he sold dildos, and so <laughs> they had it in the head, and then so the name of the, the band, they, they looked at Buzzcock and thought, well that sounds a bit saucy. <laughs> but the great thing about, the great thing about Buzz, the name Buzzcocks is, it sounds kind of slightly rude, but it's daring you to take offence, because it's not your, it's from a listings magazine about rock follies, you know, you can, you, if you find that that's offensive, that's all in your head, no. it's, and it, it doesn't mean anything, all the, I think I always say the best band names sound like they mean loads, but actually mean nothing, yeah, yeah. that's what you want from them, because if it means something, you're tied to that for the rest of your life. Also, you have, it's brilliant for graphics, yeah. the two yeah, sets, the two sets, sets. Perfect. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's very clever, <laughs> I'm that one. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's a perfect name, isn't it, because like I say, it sounds, Subversive and sounds like it actually doesn't actually like the fall in a way. Mm. The fall means everything and means nothing. That's the best kind of thing. Smiths, another Beatles, tenor, they're never going to get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that London trip, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Uh, question. Hi. Uh, did you talk about the Back to Front show? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I talk about my experience of the Back to yeah. Front show. Well, it's an interesting gig that because if you. For, what, I think it was 2012, I think. So they had this idea that they could play bigger venues if they did three sets. So you've got the current band, and then you've got the classic lineup, and then the Spiral Scratch lineup. Now, depend on who you ask, uh, Steve Diggle wasn't massively keen on the idea, I don't think. Well, I'm pretty sure he wasn't keen on the idea. But the thing about it is, so they did the first set, John and John Marr and Steve Garvey obviously didn't play in bands anymore, but they were so on point for that gig. They had obviously spent a lot of time getting ready to do that gig. And for whatever reason, because he he didn't think they should be doing that and pandering to the old days, Steve Diggle was without a bit funny. He was pissed as a fan. I mean, he was really bolshy. And, and my biggest thing was I hope he hasn't spoiled it 
for the rest, and not for me, or not for the audience, but for the, for John and Steve. Really, that's well, that was the thing I came away from it, thinking that this is a marvellous moment for them to come back, do these two shows that they've obviously worked really hard for, playing songs they're really proud of, and he's basically pissed all over it, basically. So that was my. I was quite sad in a way. I can see why you. It is Ed. Buscocks are an ongoing concern. They've got a new album out. You shouldn't be going back and doing this, you know. But you wouldn't have played this venue. Though, for them. So I think it was a bit ungracious. I can understand why he was a bit pissed off if you look at it from his point of view. But I thought it was a real shame. And that, that was the only time I ever saw the Howard Devolver line. That was the, 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 the two days. They, they only had. They only played about 12 gigs, didn't they? Yeah, 12, 12 yeah, yeah. gigs, yeah, yeah. That's, which is the other thing about that, I've had enough for this now. You've only got 12. Is it, is it, he's the first person to leave the punk movement. He was, Fox yeah. He even started. I mean, I think he was really clever in that. He knew you were. You can't go in. I mean, a lot of bands did it. But she was in the band, she got out and became a great band. Goth band or whatever you want to call them. Lots of bands, Subway Set did it. Well, the Buscox did it. but. For him to say, this is a bit of a straight jacket, this punk thing, it's becoming a bit of a job. <laughs> After 12 games. After 12 games, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, like I said, John Lydon got the same, he came to the same conclusion, but it took him another year and a half to do it, you know. Mm. Clever bloke, can't do it. I mean, what, what, what's your take on magazine? Great. Mm. And I think, like I say, I think the world's game was, was got splitting up in a way. It, we all benefited from that. I would benefit from it, Pete benefited from it, and we've got two amazing bands, yeah. Did you find uh, you liked what Howard did in the magazine better than when he was in the Buscocks? Yes, yeah. I did, yeah. Because it was more space for his It was, yeah, yeah, more space. I mean, his voice is completely different. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a different person singing. He it? stops, stops doing an impression of Johnny Rotten and becomes our developer, doesn't he? Yeah. So, no, I think I think you've got, for me, you've got Spiral Scratch Buscocks magazine. Pete Shelley's full scope, if you will, and they're, they're, that's the hierarchy as far as I'm concerned. They were great, don't get me wrong, mm. they're, 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 but they weren't a patch on either of the bands that came out. Okay, another question. Well, it's like an auction, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> going, going. <laughs> I'm just thinking, why, why didn't they think of phoning the enemy when they were in Manchester? <laughs> well, that, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting question, that, because depending on, if they've told the story that many times, the three of them. So the, sometimes Howard rings um, from Reading, sometimes he rings from London, and in Clinton and the Haywood book, uh, he rings from Manchester. So I, they don't know. I don't think they have any idea. But the thing for me is, I think they rang from London, because otherwise, why did they buy time out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I think they're out. But who knows? If they don't know, I, I can't tell them. Can <laughs> so the, the story they told me was they went to the enemy offices and knocked on the door. Well, that's not that one. Yeah. There you go. Well, it, it makes you wonder how they write the history of the Roman Empire. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get the facts straight about three boats going to London in 1976. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we touched on a brief about Richard Boone's really important this story, yeah, isn't he? He is, yeah. yeah. I mean, get, well, John Ma reckons that. Howard moved into his house in uh, Salford and Richard's room was on the ground floor next to the phone in the hall. So whenever anybody rang, he ended up answering. That's how he ended up as a manager of Buscot, because he was nearest the phone. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think he's really key. And I think a lot of that, let's help the fall, let's help join, that came from, that came from Richard, I think, because he was a bit of an old dipping in a lot of ways, you know. He, but that, to have that, well, that's, you know, Let's not make it a movement, but let's let's try and involve as many people as we can and make it culturally significant. It's amazing, and a lot of people don't do it, do they? You know? would, would, would he be influenced by Mark McLaren? That you know what he's trying to do in London, or is this just? I, I don't know. I think I, I don't think I think Malcolm McLaren's big thing was to make the make it better for the sex person, make it look like it was. Well, create a scene round. Create a scene round. But, but it worked. It did work. Yeah, no, yeah. It definitely did work. But I think I think without being. Uh, too simplistic. I think he was a bit more altruistic, Richard, than Malcolm McLaren. Which is not the biggest statement in the world. He was more altruistic than Malcolm McLaren. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Richard Boone had a, like an influence uh, cultural influence on Yes, he did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was quite the enclave that I think between Pete and Howard and Linda and Malcolm and John Savage <laughs> and Richard. Mm. Clever people, you know, culturally clever people. I think. And, they, I think there was a big, a big influence on the city without harping on about the same thing, but I think, you know, mm. it wasn't just, there was another level of thought about the whole thing, you know, where, what, 
significance, you know. It wasn't just this band, it was a bit of a situationist or whatever, but you thought about how it looked and you thought about the aesthetic of it all, which was great, you know, and it, it makes it makes it much more fascinating, I think, than just a band, you know, when you've got that whole scene. That new, new hormones on the office yeah. in town. Yeah. Like Morris, you hang around there, all the you know the people trying to get in on the scene. Yeah. Where there's a space for to go and hang out, and they created all that. They made a space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this all goes back to Buzzcocks again, doesn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. I think Buzzcocks created an amazing sort of atmosphere for creativity, I think. Yeah. Which is not to be sniffed at, you know. And it's it's easy not to do. It's easy to say, I'm in a great band and I don't need to do anything else. Anymore. But they didn't. And that, I think the history of people who don't just say, I'm alright. That's what makes things important. And then HLE, Richard Boone, they, they did that. They weren't content to just be a great band. I mean, I think they were eventually. I think they got, they were, once Buzzcocks became United Art, United Artist Artists and played, they, there was no time for doing anything else. Because that's another thing about bands in 77 to 80s. They would just work to death, weren't they? To the point where they were just killing the, killing the creativity by just slogging out. I mean, Buzzcocks did two albums in six months. Yeah, I mean, and but, sixty days and sixty days and peel yeah. sessions and everything and you know and in store appearances for the record. I mean, it's just it's not healthy or something. And I don't, I, it wasn't unique to Buscox and Clash, would they say? You know, never took a day off. You know, I think it, it, it hadn't fallen apart last night. Yeah, well, no, tops. They didn't. Yeah. No, and here we are. And here we are. We're <laughs> still talking about this rubbish. Yeah, yeah. How did it work? So, uh, time for one last question. Must be one last question. Right there. I wasn't going to ask this, we have got time. So, you strike me as a stickler for detail in a very good way. So, my publisher will tell you, does it? We <laughs> spent, just spent three weeks going does through it, the Does it rankle you ever so slightly when people call them the bus cops, or is that just me? Because they're not the monkeys. Are they? <laughs> the only thing I'll take issue with that statement there is ever so slightly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it. You, saw, you talked about the name and the symmetry with the two Zs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the middle, and There's no verb. It's more important than people think, I think. It is massively important, yeah. Pen. There's no verb. And don't listen to anybody who says that there's a Even Thank Steve you. Diggle says that there's a He's wrong. There's no one. Those cops. It's very pedantic, isn't it? You can read a whole book about that. I could, yeah. Just that's not so the, the pedantic, book. that's a fact. But you can still do it this morning. You yeah. can't, well you have to sometimes, you talk about yeah. the Buscox first or whatever, you know, you, you sometimes mm -hmm. you have to do it. It's not quite as simple as you're making it. <laughs> 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 you just said the Buscox, I said it, I trapped him into it. The Buscox first album. <laughs> he said it again. <laughs> <laughs> so is the nerve belonging to the album or Buscox? Uh, you tell me. You have to ask your yeah. <laughs>